emergency. My niece was just coming in and then uh, they poured that feed on her face. Who did? We don't know who. She was just coming back from work and someone threw it on her face. Oh my goodness. What, what's her name? Naomi? Yeah. N-A-O-M-I. I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, like, I've lost my face, my skin is burnt, and my eyes, like, I can't see. Naomi Oni says that when she saw her injured face for the first time, she didn't want to live. A happy and confident young woman permanently disfigured in a deliberate, wicked and devastating act. I was 20 years old when I was attacked, and you don't know anything at 20 years old. You're so naive, like, you wouldn't think someone can do the worst to you. My story is one of betrayal and loss, and it's only now, five years on, that I'm ready to talk about it. Since my attack, I've had to do this journey to the hospital a lot. I have laser treatments three times a year, and then I have to see my surgeon as well. We are now approaching Stratford. It is very weird, especially passing Stratford to get to the hospital. Like, it's just like, wow. I used to work here. Someone was able to just follow me all the way from Stratford home to throw acid in my face, yeah. Ready? Okay. Yeah. Right, starting on your forehead now. How's that feel? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm at the stage of acceptance, which, oddly enough, feels like the most difficult stage of the whole situation. It's uncomfortable. Would you like a bit of ice? Or yes, you okay? yeah. Because you've had the moment to grieve, you've had that moment of resentment, you've had that moment of anger, and now you're just left with you. I'm very grateful that they've, you know, they've taken the time out to actually be gentle with me. Like, you know, they get like I'm a young girl and it's a lot to deal with, like your physicals, especially your face, your face. That is so much like to deal with and, <sighs> Yeah. But five years ago, when I was 20, life was very different. I just got my first job. It was at Victoria's Secret Westfield in Stratford. You shot it out, but I can't hear when I did get the job, I was like, oh, like, they do beauty there. Like, you guys have to put me on beauty because that's what I like. So they put me on the beauty section. I had a boyfriend, so I just felt like, yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm becoming a young adult, I'm getting there. I had a Naomi on the 11th of February 1992. I was so happy, I wanted a girl. <laughs> I wasn't expecting her to be pretty. <laughs> Like that, she was very pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom, she's lovely. Her name is Marion. She's albino, so she's very fair in complexion. Um, it can affect their eyes as well, so I had to be her carer because of her eyesight. And especially because I'm her only child as well, so I've always had that. Like, I have to look out for my mom. Mama said you were pretty. My mum has always gone out of her way to make sure I feel comfortable about my physical appearance. Because I can only imagine how she probably would have felt being a, a, a young woman and having people treat you according to the way you look physically. So she's always wanted me to be smart, to be clever, to be well-spoken. Because when you do look different, the way you come across becomes more important than your physical appearance, and it has to be because it's how you're going to get through life. All the ladies, if you feel me, help me sing it out. 
My name's Vida and I know Naomi because we're school friends. I just remember us being told off a lot by the teachers. <laughs> we're not actually listening in class, but it was, it was fun. My name's Phyllis. I went to school with Naomi, secondary school. She was just a normal girl and we had a lot of common interests like music and fashion and celebrities and all that stuff. Phyllis Vida, and then there was another girl called Mary, were my closest friends. But I noticed that other girls would try and find every way to make you feel bad about yourself. Girls were just mean, if I'm honest. Girls were very mean. <laughs> I mean, from face value, it was easy to assume it didn't bother her, but myself and Phyllis and Mary were more... Um, aware of how insecure she was. So, you know, during break times, people might say, oh, look at her hair, or too much makeup, no, no, And she would just be like, oh, shut up and leave me alone. But then, you know, in class, she would get teary. So Mary, she mentioned that she was quite bullied by the girls in the year above. And like, I kind of saw that in her, so I kind of like felt protective over her. And maybe sometimes she felt like the way people treated me was quite unfair. I just felt for her. And it was just like, natural in me to just want to feel like I should like protect her or like be her friend. But I think Mary and Naomi both seek validation from each other because they had this common ground of no one really gets me almost and they just got each other. Knowing that I was loved and accepted by my friends is something that I took for granted. But that all changed on December 29th, 2012. Hello, police emergency. My niece was just coming in and then they poured acid on her face. What's on her face? They poured acid on her face. Who did? We don't know who. She was just coming back from work and someone threw it on her face. Oh my goodness. What, what's her name? Naomi. Yeah. N-A-O-M-I. I remember that day, December the 29th. It was Christmas time. I was just like, damn, like everyone, everyone's at home. My mum's cooking and I'm going to work, really? And I remember that day, actually, I bought myself like, cause they were doing like Christmas sales. I bought myself like a really nice pink, big, like fluffy pink, like Victoria's Secret robe. The store will be closing in five minutes. I remember being at work, closing up, thinking, oh yeah, like, I'm happy to be going home. Everybody seemed to be in, like, in, in, in a good mood. I... I... I did my normal journey. Stratford to West Ham. And then from West Ham, I'll get the train to Barking. And then from Barking, I would just about get the last bus home. I finished work at 11.30, so I probably got to Barking like after 12. I remember coming out of Barking Station and I remember I was hungry, like I remember being very hungry. So I was like, okay, let me just get some chicken wings and chips and I'll eat them when I get home. I got on my bus and while I was doing this journey, I was on the phone to my ex-boyfriend. Just talking, I was thinking I need a company, especially when it was late. The bus took me to my bus stop, just opposite my house, Bromhall Road. I just remember getting off the bus and I don't know, something just caught my attention. I just felt like, I felt startled a little bit. I looked to the side of me I remember seeing someone in just black. I just remember seeing black and I remember the person's face being like covered. It was a very cold stare, just a complete cold stare. I just remember thinking, whoa, like, okay. Just cross the road and go to your house. Before I knew it, I just felt a huge 
splash. And I would just remember, like, literally like that. And I remember I immediately screamed, screamed. I clenched onto my staff. I was on the phone and I was screaming, like running down my road. I did not look back. And I remember like getting to my door and banging on my door, like banging on my door, banging, screaming, screaming, screaming. I was like, it's burning, it's burning. Like acid, acid, acid. And my mum opened the door and I just saw my mum's face like, I went upstairs, um, and at this time she was in the in the bathroom. I just knew straight away that it was acid, and it was strong acid because of the way it smelled. To me, like I thought my skin was like dissolving, like I was just gonna, I don't know, like corrode away. So we opened the shower and we just doused her in in, in water. I looked down and I realised that her, her jeans was just falling apart, and then I thought, wow. This is everywhere. And I could just feel the splashes of water. My skin is burnt. I just felt like it was like, I don't know, just how can I explain? You know, when you put like, if you were to put like hot water in a glass and then you run it under a cold tap and it cracks, like it starts to break. That's how I felt. I just thought, you know, when can the ambulance or the police get here? Because I could be doing something wrong. But I just thought, you know what? You can't go wrong with water and acid, anything to dilute it. I just remember like mucus, like just flowing down my face. Like my face was like purpley, pink, green. I don't even know, like it was just multicolored. So I just remember like literally like just humming, just humming in my head, trying to like, not freak out. And I remember when the ambulance came and... <sighs> I just remember seeing my mum just so frozen. I said, please, mum, go with the rest of them. And I told my auntie to come into the ambulance with me. <laughs> I did not want my mum to come in because I didn't want my mum to freak out. They were like, okay, we're transferring her to Broomfield Hospital. It's a burns unit. I was just like, a burns unit? I gave up. Like, I, I don't know if my body just shut down. I remember coming into the hospital. It was like an episode of ER. I don't know if it was a bed, I don't know if I was on a table. I just was getting poked and like touched. And I could just hear voices in the background. Burns, something, something degree burns. My name is Nagib El Mutardi. I am a consultant plastic reconstructive and burn surgeon, St. Andrew's Center, Broomfield Hospital in Chelmsford. When we saw Naomi, the injuries was mainly on the right side of the face, the front of the scalp, the middle of the scalp, on the side of the nose, upper lip, part of the neck, the right forearm and hand, and on the left thigh. So that was the extent of the injury. We usually see these attacks in young men. So at that time, it is not that common to have it in girls. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, she, she was one of those victims. From the beginning, we knew that it is very deep. We knew that it is a full thickness damage to the skin. And she needs lots of surgeries to heal it and reconstruct it. So if you come across somebody who's been attacked with acid, I think the first thing we should do is remove any clothes which is uh, um, soaked with the, the acid. We should cut it rather than pull it over. And straight away, we should be starting the irrigation with water. This is really important, minimizing the contact, preventing the penetration of the acid. It should be done within 10 seconds. The injury which acid can inflict is much more serious than the knife, I think. 
I think it is both physical and psychological distressing because it's, it's a disfiguring injury. I mean, the, the one who's uh, attempting assault with acid, he doesn't want to kill, but he wants to disfigure and make a permanent mark on that person. I couldn't understand why anybody would do what they did. I think that's when I started to actually realize the severity of what had actually been done to me. My face was, I feel like my face was literally 10 times the size and my eyes were so swollen. I just remember like mucus was always running. It wasn't even tears. Like I just remember sometimes I'll just have to wipe like mucus, 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 mucus. That's all it was, pus, yellow stuff just coming out of my eyes. I think that's when I realized that's burning my eyes. They said there's a lot of it in your eyes and we're gonna have to wash it out with saline. So they then have to then touch my skin, stretch my eyes open to wash a corrosive substance out of my eyes with the rest of my face burnt. And I just remembered water like in my eye, in my eye, in my eye, in my eye, in my eye. And I'm like trying to blink, but at the same time open my eyes because I don't want to go blind. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to be blind. Like just this, that's not, that's not my portion. I don't want to be blind. That's what I could keep thinking. From the way she talks about it now, I think nobody expected that she was going to get her sight back. The prognosis for one of the eyes was really bad, and they said she would have some in the other eye, I think. Um, and it was only then I realised, God, acid, it, it just kind of worked its way through. After the attack, I had two major facial reconstruction surgeries. They took skin from my thighs to replace skin damaged on my arm, shoulder, other thigh, and almost half of my face. No one actually really showed me how to put makeup on as a burn survivor. I kind of had to practice, practice, practice as I went along. So this is like the most important process of my makeup because obviously it helps like bring my complexion. I tried to match my foundation as close to like my neck as possible. When you're rubbing it, you have to be careful because it's not like skin, is it? It's skin that was taken from my thigh to be put on my face. So if you cut your skin, it's not going to grow back. I lost my eyelids, so they had to take skin from behind my ears to create an eyelid. So like, I don't know if you can see like that round shape. They kind of had to create eyelids for, for, for me. I used to look in the mirror and I would just feel so hurt, like so, so hurt that this thing is so destructive, like it's actually made me look unrecognisable. Initially, like my face was quite flat. I remember my nose and like under my eye were literally the same level. So when I had to do my makeup, I had to do so much like contouring to basically make my face more 3D. So yeah, I would say I've come a very long way. A week after the attack, I was still in hospital, not knowing who had done this to me and not being able to see. But then my eyes started to open a bit. My vision became like patches, like little dots. And I think there was a day where like, you know when your screen is black and I was picking it up to like use it. And I remember I caught my reflection and I was just like, oh. I was a bit scared, like, I was like, that does not look like me. So at this point, it was the local police officers who were trying to find out who had done this to me. The police were even asking me, like, have you ever been threatened that somebody was going to throw acid at you in the past? And I said, funny enough, they said, yeah, like, someone actually has, weirdly enough, threatened to throw acid at me in the past. And I explained to them, I said, oh, uh, one time, me and my friend, Mary, we fell out and she threatened that she was going to throw acid at me. But I was like, that was so long ago. 
I explained to the officer that Mary had messaged me to see how I was and she's been calling me like since I've been in the hospital. So I was like, she's completely concerned like that I'm in the hospital. Like that's a friend because that's how a friend reacts. It happens the day before New Year's Eve when resources are low in any case. And Naomi was the only witness to the offence. It is not an easy investigation for the officers to deal with, and this went to the local police. There was extensive house-to-house -house done, but there was nobody that saw anything apart from Naomi screaming down the street as a result of this attack. So trying to prove who actually carried out this offence is very difficult. The identification goes out the window. It's all about an incident that happens in the middle of the night, you have street lighting to rely on, and the suspect was wearing a, a full niqab, which only allowed the, um, the eyes to be shown. It was six weeks after I was attacked that Mary was brought in for questioning. The time now is 13.29 on February 22nd, 2013. Eventually, local officers arrested Mary. They'd arrested her on the basis that Naomi had said her friend had threatened her before. Do you want to tell me how you know Naomi? Yeah, I've known Naomi since secondary school. How would you describe your relationship with Naomi? Yeah, I think we're quite close. Like, we speak regularly on the phone. The officer did point out that she said something we had an argument like, over a year ago. And she says that in that argument that you said that you wanted to throw acid in her face. Acid? No. Because that's a very particular mm, it's... thing. As I mean, acid attacks over here especially are very rare, so why pick a comment like that? I cannot remember saying that. And when she told me this happened to her, I was just like, why? Why? Would, why? I just don't understand. She said they had had a disagreements in the past, but it's like friends and they fall in, fall out. And there wasn't any other evidence to really tie Mary into it from a borough perspective. She was released from the police station. She was given a bail date. So I can understand how frustrated the family were. Two months and really there's nothing that you could hang your hat on for progress in that investigation. I just remember thinking, oh, I've lost my face. I'm going to be bald. I'm not going to have eyebrows, and I'm going to have thighs for a face. And I remember when, like, people would ask me, like, it must be somebody close to you, somebody close to you, somebody close to you. And I was like, people I know, like, wouldn't do anything like that to me. Anyone that knows me, I don't think is crazy enough. You know, people just ask, oh, was she rowing about a boy? And I said, not that I know of. I thought, do you know what? She was just a normal kid. There was nothing way out. The police were even asking me, like, oh, well, have you ever been in a gang? And that's when I started to think, oh. <laughs> like, things are just making a turn for the worse. It became, tell us the truth. Have you ever been in a gang? So when the police came and they asked certain questions, it was hard not to think they were fishing for information. But again, uh, I tried to be objective and thought, do you know what, they have to pursue all their lines of inquiry. I'd been in hospital for weeks and I was just about to be discharged. The police had taken my laptop and found some of my Google searches on Katie Piper and eyelid surgery. So the police found these things and that led them to like investigating me. <laughs> Like, if I did it, if I, if I threw acid on myself. My uncle just said the way it's looking, it's not looking good. They're not coming to us with any information. So let us go to the press. What I can't believe is that you just discharged a week and a half ago. I mean, you've had such an ordeal. How many operations had you had? I had two within four weeks. This person is still out there. Yeah. Uh, police don't know who they are, no. what the motive was. There's no clue as to a motive. No. So, the, so the, they have to remain open-minded about what happened that night. Yes. Um, 
What do you say to them if they happen to be watching? Um, just, I just want them to realise the pain they've put myself and my family through. Um, I hope they don't do this to anybody else. And I just want them to know that whatever they tried to do to me, they failed in doing what they were doing and they actually made me a stronger person. I'm, I'm actually happy. Um, <laughs> and um, whoever they are, if they can just come out and just reveal themselves, I'd like to know, you know, why. I don't hate them. I just want to know why. Gosh, you can't I'll come, come here. Come over here. <laughs> Dear. Thank you. Well, not at all. You sit there like that, and hopefully, at some stage, you'll be able to get some sort of an answer as to why this happened and why they so did too. this to you. And hopefully, someone will catch them so they don't do it to anybody else. Exactly. I don't want them to do it to anyone else. I don't want other girls or other people having to go through what I've gone through. At Scotland Yard, there's um, a big media type rooms at there where they monitor television uh, constantly. And this came up on a, um, a morning show, I believe, um, Philip Schofield type thing. And you have a young lady on there, it's clearly been um, the subject of an attack. And then that rings alarm bells at Scotland Yard. And it just so happened that when the request came in from Scotland Yard for this particular case to be reviewed, it was my team that was on call. I do feel like the press interest made the police up their game and really look into the situation. And this situation is like, you know, for it to go to the homicide team, that's pretty serious. After my attack, I didn't really get in touch with my friends. I didn't want to talk to many people. Vida and Phyllis were out of London at university, so they only found out when I went public. Naomi Oni, a happy and confident young woman who dreamed of working in the beauty industry, permanently disfigured in a deliberate, wicked and devastating act. I remember it very clearly. I was on my way home. My phone's always on vibrate. I just remember my phone kind of all the time. And then I got a call from my cousin and he's like, why have you even looked at my WhatsApp? You haven't said anything. I was like, why, why? Look, look at your WhatsApp. And I looked at my WhatsApp and there was literally message after message and it just said Victoria's Secret. It was like a link and said Victoria's Secret. And I, I kind of thought, what, what is this? And I clicked on it and I, I just remember seeing the image and thinking, oh my God, oh my God. I saw the pictures that came out when she was in hospital and it was still black. I was thinking, no one deserves that. Like, I wouldn't even wish that on my enemy, but no one deserves that. And I thought, I swear I just saw her like less than a month ago. And she's just like a different person now. Yeah. My face was black. My eyes were swollen. I was terrified. And I remember when I came out into the press and obviously people had seen like on the news and stuff. And I remember Mary messaging me saying, oh my God, she doesn't even look like you. I just kept thinking, who would do that? Then the press found out that the police had this theory I'd done this to myself. And that was all they seemed to focus on. I don't understand. Why am I in the hospital? Why is this happening to me? You know, why was I even attacked in the first place? Who did this? Why, 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 why? But instead, all the questions ended up on me. When they said Naomi did it to herself, like, I just thought, I can't believe they're saying that. Naomi's not the type, she's not, she would never do that to herself. I don't know anyone that would actually do that to herself. There was a whole story about some celebrity person who had acid poured on her face. And, and there were, people were drawing parallels. I'm just thinking, wow, you know, where did that all come from? It was portrayed in the media that, because she was researching Katie Piper, then, um, you know, she almost planned it because she saw, like, the outcome for Katie Piper's life after and thought, oh, maybe you know, if I did this to myself. And it's, 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 it's terrible to say that somebody would attack themselves to look like or to be like a survivor. It, it's not a joke. It was tough hearing like kind of nonsense, can I say? Like kind of being put out um, about who my friend is as a person. 
It's like, do you really want to hear my story or are you looking for a secret that I'm hiding or me to say something extra? Like, I was attacked on my way home from work. That's all I know. Like, I was attacked on my way home from work. I did not know what somebody else had in store for me. Two months after the attack, and the homicide team are now leading the investigation. We went straight back to the start, right back to the very beginning, examined every piece of CCTV. And it was very shortly after we started that that we picked Naomi up coming through Barking Station. And then you keep watching it, and then you see a woman walking through the same barriers 10, 15 seconds behind, we're in a full niqab following Naomi. It was almost like we were trying to be detectives. We were trying to work it out ourselves. It's like, who would do that, though? Like, is it someone we know? Is it, is it this? Is it that? Is it that? And we just kind of, everyone, every, every name kind of popped up, and then a particular name popped up, and then we were just like, nah. Then we're kind of silent on the phone, like. Vida called me, and we were just talking about the whole situation. And we just said to each other, what if it's Mary? Without seeing any, without anything. Mary could be quite unpredictable. She came from being polite and quite well-spoken to just being quite passive-aggressive and unresponsive almost. Back in school, like, you'd be scared of Mary, not because of you're scared that she's going to beat you up, or it was just, it was just something about her, it was just scary. You then go backwards again to a, a previous station, and you see her coming out with her friends and a bit more of a distance this time, you see the same figure in a niqab appearing to mirror Naomi's movements. Everyone's like, yeah, oh, it must be her, it must be her. It's like, no, no, but everyone was like saying it, but convincing themselves, no, 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 we don't want it to be true. We don't want it to be true at all. This person is present at Westfield Shopping Centre all the way through to Barking Station. And then they both head off together towards the bus. So when you piece all this together, you have verification of what Naomi's been telling us all along. That lady had a distinctive handbag. And when we, we viewed the custody images that we had when Mary was originally arrested, it looked like she had exactly the same bag. And then you got thinking, no, no, this looks like it's got potential. When we had to come back in on bail, this warrant was done at the address and the bag was recovered. And long story short, that has traces of damage that is typical of an acidic acid. And she changed the status on WhatsApp following the um, attack to Freddy Krueger and uh, who looks like wrong turn now. Pretty quickly, she removes that, but not before several people have seen it. Why would you do that? It just shows you what a cold, calculating woman she is. I didn't hear much, and then all of a sudden, we heard that they might have somebody. And, and we thought, who? And they said it was somebody she, she knew was a friend. And I thought, no. I can't remember who called me. And so I was like, oh my God, you never guess who. I said, don't tell me, don't tell me. It's like, yeah, it's Mary. I wasn't shocked at all that it was Mary that did it, even though it was her friend, but I wasn't shocked. They're like, Naomi, we're afraid to tell you that Mary is the person behind the niqab. And I just remember being so distraught. I thought she was my friend and I couldn't understand why she did what she did. Like, I just, I couldn't understand it. The next time I saw Mary was when I had to face her in court. I wanted to look her in the eyes to know whether she'd really thrown the acid at me and why. 
realizing somebody that you thought was your friend isn't your friend. It's a grief, yeah. And to actually, like, to be betrayed, like, I was... It's for someone to lead you to your destruction, basically. I was heartbroken, just everything all at once. Mary Cognier took the stand. Her defence formed around the line that had come out in the press about the self-infliction. Mary actually threw it because Naomi wanted her to throw it. So Naomi got publicity. And she was actually saying it to me, like, in such a strict way, like, you threw it on yourself and you didn't think um, it would hit your face. And I just thought, is this a joke? Like, are we all going to act like we're not adults? Who in their right mind would pour acid on themselves? And that's the crux of the matter. Would you do that to yourself? She was even times where she said, oh, she remembers that night calling me and we were on the phone and we were making, like, arrangements. She latched onto certain aspects, uh, certain stories that were in the press and pieced together a defence around that, but there was nothing to ever substantiate and support this type of um, theory that they had hatched a plot together. We had to prove that the person that was coming through the gates following Naomi in the niqab was one and the same person that was Mary Cognier. Yes, the bag was one thing, but there was something else individually specific to Mary Cognier. When I saw the CCTV, I knew straight away that it was Mary. Mary has a distinctive walk. Um, she's always had it, but it was Mary. She puts weight on one side of the foot rather than the other, and it gives her a role. So we had an expert in gait analysis analyse the imagery that we had from the CCTV and comparing it, the woman in the niqab, to the woman in the custody office, that it was one and the same person. I think Mary is a very calculating person, devoid of any empathy or remorse. After the incident, she even went to Naomi's birthday party that her family arranged and she sat there and she's talking to the family, she's talking to Naomi, offering her sympathy. For someone to do that, you've got to be a very cold and calculated type of person. I didn't know she was like that. I was just shocked. I think more than anything, I was shocked and I was actually scared. Not even scared of her, but scared of how I could really think that I knew somebody for about 10 years to realise that I didn't know them at all. Like, what is it that I was missing out on? Like, how could I have avoided this? There was an intense love. It was motherly, it was sisterly. Romantically, maybe, at some point, I don't know. Um, but then there was something in the middle of it that just was sour. But it was almost like when you love something so much, there's going to be something about it that you hate, and that hate can just make you do crazy things, I think. So Mary is a dark-skinned girl. I've always thought she was a beautiful person, a beautiful girl. But she didn't feel that way. Her mum's of, like, a lighter skin complexion. Her sisters were of a lighter skin complexion. So maybe that caused her a lot of frustration. A lot of black women feel that the lighter you are, the more better looking you can be. Obviously, you can't really change your features, but people just feel that to look better is to be fairer. Which I don't think is true, but I think that probably was a big thing for her. When I saw Mary, I just I noticed she'd gone lighter, quite lighter. Um, and Amy is light-skinned, and I know that they're friends. So I just assumed that, OK, she's trying to look more like Naomi. That's what I, that's what I felt. The court heard Konya had disguised herself and carried out the attack out of jealousy. I don't honestly understand her type of person. I really don't. To this day, like, even the thought of her boggles my mind. To me, a friend is somebody who loves you despite 
your flaws. That's what friends should be like. And when I looked at her, I was like, yeah, like this is a person who I thought was my friend and she's just a big coward. Mary Cognay, the suspect, has now been found guilty. It's the throwing of a cool stick, liquid, with intent to maim this figure, all resulting from a, a trivial, insignificant argument that everybody has in their everyday lives. But Mary Cognay has taken this so far that she has planned this, disguised herself, and followed Naomi on that night on the 29th of December, 2012. I wouldn't even want an apology because an, an apology now would be an insult. What kind of apology could she possibly give when she knew what she was doing? I met up with Naomi, I guess, a couple of months after. And literally, we I mean, it was it was funny because I think for like 30 seconds, I just froze. I was like, hi. And she was like, hey, and hugged me. And then we just kind of stared at each other for like 30 seconds and didn't say anything. I could hear her voice. I knew it was her. She smelt the same. She laughed the same. It's almost like when I was looking at her face, I was almost like in my mind moulding the year eight Naomi, I cuddled. But I just saw her heart still, and I was like, she's still beautiful to me. I think I remember writing that on her wall on Facebook, like, you know, you're still one of the most beautiful girls I've ever met. Oh, yeah, picture. <laughs> no, I don't look at my weave. You guys are not good friends because <laughs> this is not nice. <laughs> I like this picture. <laughs> what else did I find? This one. Aww. Aww. I have some pictures. This is a picture of me. <laughs> you always laugh at this picture. Every time I show it, so I used cute. to bring this picture to school. And Phyllis used to be like, look at wow. Naomi's cheeks. She's so cute. cute. Look. Yeah, I like crazy. this poncho. And then look at this person. Wow. Mm. Mm. She's yeah. just segregated herself. And look, even look at the way she's looking. Like, it's weird, isn't it? Mm. I like my outfit. Yeah, you look cute, girl. I don't know who I thought I was, <laughs> oh, but yeah. Oh. oh, I love all these pictures. Yeah, good good photos, good photos. Memories. Memories. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is what I do with Amelia. Oh. <laughs> Every single day is different. Every single day you learn something new. Every single day you have to learn, you have to have a different type of strength in different situations. Like, it's hard, it's hard. And just knowing the difference of how you're even being treated when you go out and the way people look at you and the way people stare at you. 20 years, I didn't have to deal with that. Like, and I have to deal with that now. And no man is an island. Like, I'm only human. That's it. Like, I'm only human. That was a nice conversation. Good. I like that. Good. Yeah. I like that. <laughs>